Hi, this is a straight line executive black belt uh, supplement for uh, data analysis examples. And this follows the section on how to analyze in week three. We're going to cover today slides 17 through something like 59 in your book. Yeah, 59, slides 59 in your book. Okay, so that's what we're going to cover today. We're going to extensively use um, uh, Excel statistics. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, after completing this, you will be able to execute a sound analysis for the following situations. One variable, two situations, one variable analysis and two variable analysis. And for that, you're going to be able to do, um, for that, you're going to be able to do uh, numerical and categorical for one variable analysis, and then for two value, variable analysis, we're going to do a cat cat. So input of cat, output of cat. Here's our x, here's our y. Oops. We're going to do cat cat. We're going to do um, num cat. And we're going to do num num. Now, I want to say that what we're doing is we're going to scratch the surface here. Okay, we're not going to cover to the the great depths everything, but the idea is we should be able to do a number of different examples of what we just call of what we just covered in the last section. So here we go. Here is a few places in the Demaic process where this may come in handy for taking an initial look at the data for baselining. In fact. I'll circle that too, even though it's not explicitly highlighted here. Obviously for analyzing the data and also for evaluating your improvements. Those are some key places where we're going to be using this. However, having said that, you can use it in any general business setting. <clears throat> we'll call, uh, okay, so here we go into one variable analysis. As I said, we're going to cover one num and one cat. Okay. All right, here's our first example. Uh, to do this, we're going to open the following file from our data files directory, DMV wait times. And the setting is um, that uh, we've got a bunch of people who are waiting in line at the DMV. Um, and maybe we've just started our Six Sigma project and we've collected, we want to collect some data. We've got some data collected and we want to put together a baseline. Okay? In this case, um, if we do, here's our process situation, right? We've got wait time, which is a number. And if we want to do our PGA wheel, our P, G, A, our P might be, <clears throat> let's uh, set a baseline for a wait time. Okay? And we'll see which graphs and which analyses we do. Okay, the first thing is let's take a look at um, let's take a look at the um, it was DMV. So let's open that up. I've got Excel statistics open. We'll select that data and then click on our one num, which opens up our one num analysis. And there we have it right there. Okay, folks. So this is basically it. We're going to look at um, a couple of things. First of all. Let's take a look at the histogram. Okay, that's what I've got right here, a frequency chart or a histogram. I'm going to connect those. And I'm also going to widen up the gap just a little bit. It goes from a minimum of 10 minutes to a maximum of about 31 minutes that people wait. Typically, it looks like they wait about 18 to 22 minutes. And that's the sort of thing that we're going to take away from this. We've got 90 of them. Um, and uh, again, it goes from 10 to 31 minutes. We've got 90 with a mean of 20 and a, uh, and a median of about 20 as well. Okay, so let's take a look if I, uh, if I expand this out a little bit. Maybe I'll go from 5 to 35. And that will give, give me a little bit more on the outside, and I'll <clears throat> make 15 boxes instead. And there we go, and that's nicely labeled, and I can see it looks kind of like a bell curve, something like that. Okay, now, if we do have the data in time order, and in fact, in here it says, uh, it doesn't say anything about uh, time order, but if we did have the data in time order, 
we could do also a um, uh, the time series plot. And the time series plot would have some meaning. This would essentially be a time series plot where it would be from the earliest time to the latest time. And then here we're looking for trends. Don't really see too many. Maybe there's a few outlying points I'd be interested in, uh, namely uh, these over here. Whoops, let me make my uh, pointer again. All right, yeah, there we go. Hey, come on. There we go. Maybe uh, some of these right here I might be interested in. Give my red pen. Or I might even be interested a little bit in this clump right here. But mainly I'm looking to see if this is trending or anything like that. And I'm not seeing any major trends. So that's kind of what I put together for my baseline. Looks like it's a bell curve. Typical wait times between, what do they say, 18 and 22? I could even say 19 and 23. That looks like that's where the typical ones are. Min of about 9. I guess it's 10. Max of 33, 31. There we go. So it ranges between those guys. And it's fairly stable. All right. So that would be our PGA. Now, if we wanted to, we could... Uh, and let's let's talk a little bit about the the now let's spend a little bit more time on some of the analyses that we've just done. As I said, this was a histogram, and in this case, you can see I've put fifteen classes. I've gone from five to thirty five. I guess I did the same thing that we did in there. Okay, and again, it shows that if the data are time ordered, that it doesn't look like there's any trending that's here. Now, what we've just seen is we've seen a histogram, and a histogram kind of tells us um, to a large extent sort of where the data accumulate. And by accumulation, I'm talking about, you know, by where the bigger humps are. What it really shows is it shows my, ver my key variable on the right-hand side. Uh, really? It hey, come on. It shows my key variable that I'm interested in a... There I go. All right, felt tip. It shows my key variable, in this case my wait time, right, on this axis right here. Let's say wait time. <laughs> my writing is terrible today. On this axis, and this tells me the height of the bar is essentially how many are counted within that particular bin in this case from 25 to 26. Now you notice this isn't the same, it doesn't look like it's the same thing that we just looked at. Uh, maybe it is, it looks pretty similar actually. Now, there's all sorts of different shapes that we can have. The, the one that we just looked at before was what's called a bell. What we're really doing is we're looking for what are typical shapes that we could, if we wanted to, draw a smooth curve. <clears throat> this is probably the one that you're most familiar with, but there are other ones as well. Here's one that's called a skewed distribution. A skewed distribution kind of looks like this. Okay, it's longer on one side, has a long tail. It's longer on one side than the other side. There's a few, <clears throat> later on we're going to look at, uh, we said that this, there's actually a certain equation that fits this model. If we see a histogram that looks like this, we might say a normal curve fits that pretty well. If we see something that looks like this, we might say that there are other statistical models. We'll learn these later on. Uh, the three that we're going to learn are log normal, exponential, and Weibull. That can all take on these sorts of looks to them. Uh, here's one that's called the uniform distribution. This one is more or less flat across the range. I will say that, that <clears throat> these are the sorts of things, normal distribution, happens in a lot of natural processes. Or if you're averaging, like uh, some of you might be looking at average, call, average handle time in a call center, that could be, because you're averaging, it could end up being uh, uh, more normal. Um, this distribution right here is something that looks kind of like, uh, it's more on the right-hand side. Uh, these happen when you're limited on one side, but unlimited on the other. A good example are if you're measuring wait times. In this case, it turned out to be uh, it turned out to be more or less normal. But a wait time often is uh, looks kind of like this. It's skewed on one side. Why? 
because you're unlimited on one side, but you're limited on the other. What's the fastest wait time that you'll have? Zero seconds or zero minutes. So other things that are typically uh, 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 skewed to the right are things like salaries or house prices. Those, those tend to be skewed to the right. Um, uniform, um, we might get something like that when it's equally likely over a certain range. Uh, what uh, day during the week is a certain product going to be delivered or what, what's the delivery time? Sometimes it's flat, sometimes it's not. Okay, Here's, here are some other ones. Like you can have uh, a distribution that looks like it only has one mode. In this case, this, is a, this one has two modes. Every hump is called a mode, so this one is called bimodal. You can also have, you know, trimodal distributions. You can have as many modes as you want. Now, typically, it's a nice thing to see. It means that you can probably break up between groups, some group that maybe you're not looking at. Maybe it's males and females or something like that. Or maybe it's one department versus another department or night shift versus the day shift and so forth. Here's a pa another pattern that you can look for is to look for outliers. In this case, we've got one outlier over there. And what we often might want to do in this case is really check out what's going on on that outlier and then <clears throat> remove it from the analyses. Not to remove it, uh, not to not look at it. It's, importantly con it's important to consider it, but um, to remove it so that we can see in more detail uh, this over here. Finally, um, here's one that's one of my favorite the dog food distribution. Kind of looks like a dog dish, yeah? Now, it can be on one side as well, but uh, two sides. This happens a lot <clears throat> in cases where people are massaging the data pretty heavily. They're creating some, um, unbeknownst to them, maybe they're cre cre uh, creating some uh, barriers that uh, things can't come through. Um, I've seen these sorts of things happen in real life before when people are massaging data. But you'll also see them in real processes as well. Okay, let's take a look at now um, our, our next example, which will be for one. So that basically winds it up for one number analysis. Okay, let's take a look at um, the types of things that we can do when we have one categorical var variable. So one of these, uh, the 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 good and bad news is that. Um, the good news is that it's very easy to analyze. There's not much to do uh, because all you can do is count things in certain categories. The bad news is that there's not much that you can do with category data. So our analysis isn't going to be our analysis isn't going to be very detailed. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at this example: uh, defect types. I'm going to get rid of our DMV wait times just so you don't confused by that. Okay. Defect types. Uh, there it is right there. Okay. So what we've got here is we've got um, a Um, we've got a um, column of data, and it looks like it's labeled R, A, M, P, I, P, L, P, S2, S1, and so forth. At least it looks like these are different defect types that are found in safety and reliability. Over a six-month period, people collected all these things. So let's take a look at that. Here's a clear case of categorical variable, right? I can't add R, A plus M and have it mean anything. I guess R, A plus M equals RAM. <laughs> um, but uh, no, that was just uh, not really. <laughs> How about RA minus M or RA divided by M? Okay, so it doesn't really have any meaning. Let's take a look at one cat and we'll see what we can do. Pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Excel statistics <coughs> doesn't do much for you, but uh, hold on just a second here. There we go. Excel statistics doesn't do too much for you, but it does sum up all of the things um, in each of their categories, all the defect types. And you can see that there's type RA, there's type M, there's type PL, S2, there's A, there's RT. Anyway, they have different counts. 
Now, the interesting thing is that, or not the interesting thing, but the conclusion, if you were on a project and you were, say, um, in the beginning of the project and you were looking for what should I scope my project down to, you might say something like, well, since M and S2 occur an awful lot, maybe we should focus our project on those two, or maybe we'll add an PL or something like that. But in any case, it tells you what happens more frequently. Now, I want to make sure that, you, um, that I point this out, and that is that you'll note that the, um, that the, um, uh, the, this looks like a histogram, right? A histogram looks like a bar chart, but it's not. If you look very closely on the x-axis, on this axis right here, um, uh, uh, where it has defect types, remember in the histogram, it would, those were numbers, and they, the, basically the numbers went from and to, and the boxes fit into those. Um, in this case, they really are distinct categories, and the order is kind of irrelevant, right? Okay just to point that out. So that's basically it. Not much else that we can do with that. So just to recap on our one variable analysis, <clears throat> remember, as we're always doing this, what we're starting out with is drawing that process box. We're drawing our variable. In this case, uh, in one of the cases, it was wait time. And in the other case, it was defect types. We're labeling it as a num or a cat. And then we're going ahead and picking either one cat or one num analysis. If it's one num, uh, you know what, let me just erase some of this here. There we go. If it's, uh, if it's one num, we're going to do a histogram, and that's going to show the shape of our data or where the data accumulate. Remember, histogram kind of looked like this. Okay, and we're going to do a time series plot. If we have the data over time, Excel stats will give you a time series plot. Okay, all right. If we have categorical, we're just going to do a bar chart. We'll learn something a little bit later called a Pareto chart, um, which is actually nice because it puts things in the order of occurrence. Kind of helpful. All right, in any event, um, We'll do a Pareto chart a little bit later. We're going to start with a bar chart, and uh, that just shows the uh, breakdown. Okay. Let's move on now to something much, much, much more interesting, and that's two-variable analysis. We're going to cover all the cases of two-variable analyses, or two-variable analysis, I should say. We're going to cover cat-cat. We're going to cover num-cat. <coughs> um, we're going to cover num-num. Now, the two most important, the one that doesn't come up very often is this one in terms of input-output situations. It can come up when you have two categorical variables uh, and you're interested in relating them. It can come up. But um, the, ones that are, the one that's really the most important is this one, and you ought to star it, because there's a lot of typical ways of sort of slicing and dicing. Typically, we will have a num on the output. Uh, are why. If you think about it, if you're measuring quality, you've got some sort of quality measurement, defect rate, or something like that. If you're measuring cycle time, you've got a cycle time measurement. Both of those are numbers, and we'll be looking to slice those by different things, by manager, by department, by whatever. Okay, so let's go to it. Let's start out with CC. Cat cat. Okay, so in this example that we're going to go through, we've got a company. It could be a utility company, but it could be a service company as well. There's lots of different analogies that you've got here. In this case, we've got a company that's performing in-house service, and they measure something can't, called can't get in, CGIs, <clears throat> on randomly selected calls. Uh, the company is going to wonder whether this number differs by service center A, by manager A or B. They're going to analyze the data, in CGI.xls to, uh, there's our data file, to see whether the, the, the proportion of CGIs differs by manager. So let's write that up. Here we've got CGIs. That's our key output. And as we'll see when we open it up, it's either going to be a 1 or a 0, or a yes or a no. Yes, it was a CGI. 
or no. Right? That is a cat or a C. Now on the input, <clears throat> we've got manager. Manager A or B, which is a cat. Right? It's either one or the other. Okay, let's take a look at it and let's open it up. Close down some of my Excel sheets here. And let's open this up. Okay, so here I've got a nom and a cat, so I've got two cat. I'm sorry, I've got a cat cat, so I've got two cat. All right. Now it's not clear always what's the input and what's the output and which column, and Excel stats doesn't know, of course. So um, we're just going to play around with that. We'll see what, what comes of it one way or the other. So the most important thing is this will give you some summaries on the data and description, but we want to go to the summaries tab. That's where most of the meat is, and that's where we're going to start out. Whoops, I forgot something. One thing I didn't do, one thing I did not do was I didn't use my PGA wheel. So here I've got PGA, and this is going to be, English language question is going to be, I wonder if manager drives CGI. Okay, that's going to be our question. Now, <clears throat> notice I phrased it in, I wonder if X drives Y. That's the real question. Okay, let's start out with that. And then uh, first things to do are to make a plot or two. So let's take a look at what plots we can examine. Here's a couple of plots. Remember, I'm on the summaries tab. And in this case, I find that this upper one is, is very helpful. This is a clustered bar graph or clustered bar chart. And you can see we've got some different options. So I can show frequencies or percentages. I like to show percentages. And really what I want to be doing is I want to be uh, uh, comparing the CGI category of yes. Yes, it was a CGI, which is bad, um, uh, to manager A and B. And it looks like it's not organized in the way that I want it. So I can do two things. One is I can switch these on the data and description. And that's pretty straightforward. And it went ahead and did that. The other thing I can do is leave them be and just hit the swap thing, and that's very, very helpful. Now, notice what it did is it compares manager A and B to each other. All right, pretty cool. Now, I might want to also show column-wise, in this case, we're showing column-wise percentages. I can show the values if I want to, which is kind of helpful. I can show them to one decimal place or zero decimal places or what have you. Okay? So that's for starters. Now, we're going to do a couple of things now. The, now, the interesting thing is, uh, uh, what do we think? Remember, when we're doing the, the um, when we did the PGA wheel, we did a graph, and the first thing is, we're going to evaluate that graph, and I wonder if manager drives CGI. The question is, does it? Well, certainly when we take a look at the plot, there is a difference, to be sure. It's a little bit, there, there's a difference between one manager and the other. However, the real question is, is that difference statistically meaningful for the data that we've got? We've only got 100 of each of these guys. Maybe 100 isn't enough data. <clears throat> point. It certainly looks a little bit different, but we're going to see whether it actually is different. Now, there's two different ways of doing this. The first I'm going to show you is right here, and the second is in your book. The first way of doing this is to use something called a confidence interval. So we're going to click on confidence interval, and for reasons now that will become clear in week four, 
I'm going to leave this at 95%. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, as closely as possible, look to see if these two things overlap with each other. I'm going to take out the value so it's clearer. Now here's the point. <clears throat> it, put, it calculates confidence intervals for each one of these boxes. So in other words, it says that this, this height, if we had a lot more data, could be, this is kind of like a margin of error. You know how on a poll they have a margin of error that's just like plus or minus 5% or whatever? That's what this is right here. So Excel Stats is putting a plus or minus on here, and we're going to call that a confidence interval. But that's really the margin of error from that point estimate or from that, that estimate of what we've got. Okay, now the key thing is if these two things overlap with each other, it means that we can't really tell that there's a statistical difference. And that's important to note. Okay, so in this case, we would really say, yeah, there's not a lot of difference between manager A and manager B. There's not a statistical difference, even though there's maybe a little bit of a difference in, in terms of the data that we collected. We can't say if we collected another 100 data points that we'd get the same results. That's the idea. Okay? All right. Now, <clears throat> okay, so that's basically what we got right there. Um, I'm going to also take you through this and help you understand um, this, uh, uh, this display that's given on one of the following pages. All right, and that's on 34. So let's take a look at that, get out of that, and I'll show you where that is. So if we go back to our uh, two cat, whoops, I went to one num for some reason. Let's go back to two cat. Here we are right here. And you click on the tests R by two. What we want to do is we're going to, we're going to uh, compare CGI for uh, uh, manager A and manager B. So we're going to compare yeses, not noes, for manager A and manager B. Now we can flip these around. I'm not sure why I put B before A. That's not clear to me. All right. So here's how we interpret this. For now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at this thing called a p-value. Got it? Right here. And what does that mean? Well, um, that means <clears throat> you're my, my statistics advisor is going to roll over in his grave when he hears me say this, if he hears me say this. But I'm not sure how you could hear me say it, but <laughs> given what I just said. However, here's what it means. It's the probability that there is a difference. I'm sorry, that is th that it's the probability that there is no difference. And if that probability is very, very low, we're going to reject that notion that there's no difference and say that there is a real difference. In other words, Low values of the p-value are statistically significant. High values are not. p is going to go between 0 and 1. Therefore, what we're going to usually say is a low value is 0 0.05. Okay, that's a low value of a p. Not 0 0.5, but 0 0.05. So you can see that this is much, much greater than 0 0.05. So we are going to say it's not statistically significant. And guess what? That was exactly the conclusion that we came to when we looked at this. We said they don't look like they're statistically different. Now, I don't know if you're, <laughs> if you're like me, the conclusion from the plot is a lot easier to swallow and understand. But it's going to be important for us to understand how to evaluate later on a p-value. All right. That's just what this says on slide 34. And... Um, uh, uh, basically, it says it in two different things. The first is um, <clears throat> the first is with the confidence interval, and it says uh, the confidence interval overlaps zero. Therefore, uh, there's no difference between the two. We can't conclude. And a, a second thing is to uh, look at the p-value, which is this 0.35. Okay, so both of those things are in there. So it looks like for this case. There doesn't, this doesn't appear to be a key driver, and so, um, and so we would essentially say, oops, I didn't want to cross that off, 
we would essentially say that for CGIs, right, we had manager, we plotted it, we graphed it, and we analyzed it, right? Our graph, what we uh, we plotted, we we put the practical. I wonder if it's a driver of this, cat, cat. First thing we did was we made a graph, right? We compared it. It looked like there was a maybe a difference between the two. It looked like there might be a difference. But when we analyzed it, <clears throat> we found that, no, in fact, there wasn't a statistical difference because these guys overlap. All right? Let me show you an example of when they don't overlap, and so you can make that uh, distinction, and you can say, yes, there is a real difference. Okay? Before we go on to the next one, which is NumCat. To do that one, um, to, to do that one, what I'm going to do is I am going to close up CGI, go to the data here, and I'm going to look at tax abatement. This may be one in your future homework. Maybe. You'll notice that we've got two cats here. In this case, um, what we've got is um, a situation where um, uh, 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 if we look at the, let's just make our box here, okay, and our arrow coming out. This was our output is uh, response, and our input is type. And the question is, I wonder if what, what we're doing is we went out, we we want to pass a tax abatement, and so we went out and we went out in this county uh, for for cell phone towers, and we went out in the county and we we made a survey, and somebody could either agree with the tax abatement, disagree, or they would be neutral. And the question is, I wonder if that varies by the type of residence, whether it's city or rural. Okay? <clears throat> and, and presumably, that would help us understand where we could spend our dollars. In this case, we've got a cat output and a cat input. Again, pretty rare, but here we go. Excel statistics to cat. Let's go ahead and replace this. And now look at when we do the summaries. You see that the, the, the people who disagree in the rural and in the city, there's a lot more people that disagree with the tax abatement in the city than there are in the rural areas. And just the opposite would be agree. And you'll notice that those things do not overlap. Therefore, we can conclude that there's a statistical difference. And in fact, I'm going to take a look at that. Here it is. We wanted to disagree rural versus city. And there's our, whoa, look at how low that p-value is. Extremely low, right? Uh, 1.39 times 10 to the minus 5. That's 0 0.00001.39. That's pretty small. And you can see that this does not overlap 0. Both of them are negative. All right. So that's really the difference. It's going to look like this as opposed to the things where they don't over, uh, overlap. Okay. Let's now move on to our next one, which is uh, cat. Uh, I'm sorry, num cat. As I said, this one's probably the more, uh, the most um, uh, important one. Okay. So <clears throat> in this case, what we're going to do is now. This one is a little bit different than most examples where we have one num one cat. In here, I've got actually a before after situation. So I've got a, um, I've got, um, uh, I've got, I'm looking at backlog volume before and after I made a process change. So it's really not the process box, but we're going to do it as well. So the question is um, going to be on our PGA wheel. I wonder if there's a difference between before and after we made the change. Here we're then going to look at the graph. If it looks like there might be a real statistical difference, then we'll back that up with, an, with a calculation. And if the calculation is favorable for us, that is, if our changes really did work and they're significant, we're going to keep. 
the change. Okay? So that's what's going on right here. All right, so we're going to take a look at the data in backlogs before and after. And there's our tax abatement. I'm going to close that up. All right. Backlogs before and after. And you can see it's organized into backlog volume before and after. Let's take a look at this. Remember, it's one num, one cat, right? Backlog is number, time period is a cat. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and click that. On the data and description um, page, it's it's interesting, but it's not um, it's not exactly what we want to be looking at. Okay, so there's a couple of other analyses that are going to help us. Remember, the first thing we'll want to do is look at a graph. So those are going to be on the summaries tabs. Now there's three of the graphs. The first is this one right here, which is a multiple frequency chart, and um, this one, actually, for this particular example, is relatively easy to read. What we've essentially got is two histograms on one, uh, on one graph. And you can see that if the histograms look like they're bimodal, like before and after, it looks like before, the backlog volume was very high. Afterwards, it's nice and tight. So indeed, and I'm going to maybe emphasize that by putting more boxes that are there. Um, I'll see if I can widen that a little bit. I guess I can't. Um, and let's make it go, I don't know, from 10 to 70. That'll maybe make it a little bit easier to read. And sure enough, it looks like there's a good amount of separation between the two. Okay, so here we actually can tell it looks like there's a big difference between the before and after. Usually, this is very, very messy and very hard to read. So I'm going to give you two additional ways of looking at this. Okay. The first way is to look at separate frequency charts. So separate frequency charts simply draw a new frequency chart each time. Uh-oh, there we go. It took a little while. They do take a while to make. Okay. Separate histograms, what they are is really separate histograms. I'm going to leave, you know what, I'm going to leave it as a bar um, <clears throat> for before and after. And, and you can look and compare them relatively easy. Again, you can see the one is shifted to the left compared to the first one. Now this can get a little bit, this is fairly detailed and it can get a little messy if you've got a lot of data or a lot of different groups. What happens if we had five groups? Then the comparison we'd have to make by scrolling off and that might be a little bit difficult for us. Oh, by the way, to get back in Excel stats, you see this little blue arrow? Just go ahead and click it and it brings you right back. Now, I'm actually going to close that one down because that takes up a lot of memory. As you can see, it took a long time to do it. All right. The second type of plot that I'm going to look at is a box plot. A box plot is very efficient um, because if I only had two data points <laughs> or two groups, it, I could have just used a separate frequency plot. However, if I have many, many groups, like five or six or ten, a box plot is very easy to quickly compare a bunch of them. Okay, so what we're doing here, <clears throat> a box plot is, uh, some people call it a five number summary. Basically, it shows the bottom, the minimum. Uh, the bottom of the box is the 25th percentile. The middle, if you recall, is the median. The top is the 75th percentile. I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Whoops, really blew it up. The top of the box is the 75th percentile, and the highest point is the maximum. Uh, these little X's are outliers, and there's some outlier rules if they exceed what would be the normal maximum or the normal minimum. Uh, however, you can see what you're trying to do is look at two things. The first is the, the relative height in the plot of each of these of each of these guys. Notice how this one seems to be hovering above the before seems to be hovering above the after. If that's true, you might say. On average, it looks like the before is greater than the after. Okay? I call that the UFO test, right? I pretend that I'm that these guys are hovering, these are UFOs hovering in a field somewhere. And it's goofy, so it makes me remember it. Okay. Um, if they're not, if they're more or less uh, lined up with each other, I might say there's no difference. 
The second thing that I compare is I have what I call the birthday present test. Now for the birthday present test, I only look at the box. I only look at what's between the 75th, I'm sorry, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. Okay, the bottom and the top and of the box. And I want to compare the size of this box to the size of this box. Now in this case, it does look like <clears throat> the after box is slightly smaller than the before box. But how much bigger or how much smaller is it? doesn't look like it's that significant to me. So I'm going to be mostly focused on the difference in the sizes uh, or in the positions. So if the boxes are different sizes, I would say the standard deviations might be different. Okay? All right. If they hover, if one hovers above the other one, I might say the means are different. Okay. It looks to me like the means might be different, but the standard deviations probably not that different. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at that, and we'll test it. So it looks like um, right here, uh, means might be different. Maybe mu before is not equal to mu after. But the standard deviations, mu before, mu after, I don't know. They might be more or less equal. They didn't look much different. So let's test those notions. And we can do that right in here. Now, there's a couple of different ways to do this. There's our regular um, average uh, mean. So we're going to test two categories. Later, we'll do the test in n categories. But right now, we're going to stick with two. So here's kind of similar to what we had before. Um, and I'm going to show you both of these because one of the reasons why is because um, the standard deviation test is uh, we can only get here. And it's called the F test. All right, here's the first one. If the two are the same, that would mean that the difference is zero, and we would expect a big value here. However, it looks like it's a very small value, right? It's .000000. There's 25 zeros in front of this 299. So that's extremely small. So in this case, the means are different. The before and after means are different. That should make sense to you. If you look at it, it did, in fact, look like those box plots were different from each other. Okay? So far, so good. The second thing is you'll note that the confidence intervals do not overlap zero. All right. Before we go on, there is actually a very nice picture of that in Excel stats, and it's down here, plot of means with error bands. If we click on the confidence interval, you can certainly see the before and after, man, there's a big difference between those guys. The fact that they are not overlapping means that it's statistically significant, which is supported by this right there. Okay, and this is, by the way, in your book on slides 40 and 41. Let's now go to the last one, which is a test for variance. And this is important because our answer in the book is actually not correct. So let's go ahead and do the F test for variance. And oh, wait a second. OK, sorry about that short break. <clears throat> I want to make sure that we do this. So the F test is actually for variances. Now, what's the difference between a standard deviation and a variance? Well, a standard deviation is simply a um, uh, the variance squared. So, um, so nothing, nothing crazy there. Whoops. Um, so uh, what I wanted to say was the standard deviation is simply instead of sigma, we're, instead of comparing sigma b is equal to sigma a, we're going to compare sigma squared b is equal to sigma squared before and after. Okay, we're going to see if they're equal or not equal to each other. And remember, we're going to look at that p value, and if it's low, if it's small, they really are different. Okay, later we'll use we'll learn a funny rule for that. So let's go ahead and click on the f test. And there it is right there. 
indeed it looks like it's a very small p-value. So therefore, um, it's, uh, they really are different. So despite the fact that they didn't look different, they really are. I wish I had a better picture of this, but unfortunately Excel Stats doesn't give one. You have to simply use this, um, this particular analysis. And there we go. All right, so now let's, let's go back to what our conclusions would be. Um, so we did our PGA wheel. Uh, we looked at, and we said, are the means the same? Are the standard deviations the same? And in fact, we went ahead and checked those. They're both different. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we're going to keep our changes because it looks like the backlogs not only went down, but we're more consistent now, which is also good. Okay. And on the slides 40, I'm sorry, 39 through 42, we've got our analysis of that. Okay. All right. Um, we'll do one more practice. And for this one, we'll take a look at, um, for this one, we will uh, look at the example five on slide 56, uh, just briefly. And this one is discharge times for patients at two similar types of, uh, ooh, types of inpatients. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, discharge times for, for patients for two similar types of inpatients. Uh, in, I guess in two similar types were measured at two different hospitals. The data and corresponding summaries are given in discharge times. And we want to know, is there a difference between the hospitals? So let's, let's for a moment draw our, our, uh, our little uh, thing here. We've got discharge times and these are cat, oh, I'm sorry, these are nums. And we've got hospital, let's say A and, A and B, right? And that's a cat. All right, so let's do the one num, one cat <clears throat> uh, uh, analysis on this. Here's discharge times. I'm going to open this up. One num, one cat. We'll replace this. Note that our discharge times look like that's a uh, skewed distribution, right? Okay. Let's take a look at our summaries. Whoops. Now here's an example where we don't have, where I said we, it's mixed, right? It looks like they're mixed up. We've got hospital one and three. I don't know what happened to hospital two, but they're gone. Uh, let's just go from zero to 80. That might look a little bit cleaner. All right, but they're overlapping. Maybe five would be a little bit above, uh, or hospital three would be a little bit longer than hospital one, it looks like. Let's take a look at separate frequency charts. This takes a little bit of time. I wish it were faster. It's not. And there we go. Yeah, it looks like maybe the discharge time for hospital three is a little bit longer. Again, I'm going to close this up so it's not running in the background. And uh, let's take a look at our box plots. Yep, UFO test. Yeah, it does look like three hovers a bit above number one. And it does look like the box is a little bit bigger, too. So it looks like maybe hospital number three is taking a little bit longer. So let's take a look at that. Let's first take a look at the average. Yeah, look at this. If I put a 95% confidence interval, it doesn't look like they overlap. Very close, but no cigar. So that does, in fact, mean that there is a difference in the averages. There's a statistical difference. If somebody says you want a p-value for that, there it is right there, 0 0.0049 is the p-value. Now let's check out the, the standard deviations, see if there really is a difference in standard deviations. Yes, indeed, it does look like the standard deviation is also statistically higher in hospital number three. Okay, and we can tell that by looking at one and three. Okay, so there we go. So that's our answer for this one. It does look like hospital number three 
<clears throat> it does look like hospital is a driver. I'm going to circle it. It does look like it's a driver of discharge time. And it looks like the means are not the same. Mu1 is not equal to mu3. And it looks like the standard deviations are not the same either. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that if you were running the project, maybe you would look at, um, you know, hospital number one for best practices. Or maybe you would look and see if there's any differences in the process that happen for discharging in one hospital versus the other. Okay, hopefully that helped to flush it out even more. All right, let's take a look at our last category now. Oops, our last category. And for that, I'm going to go back to slide 43. <clears throat> and this is num num. Now we're going to do a lot on num num a little bit later. One num, uh, I'm sorry, two num. Uh, suffice it to say, though, that there are a lot of different situations where this could happen. Let's say you're measuring uh, handle time in a call center, clearly, and that was your key output variable. Clearly, that is a number. You might want to look at is the handle time based on the experience level of the CSR. In fact, it might be, right? And that would also be a number. So there's lots of different places where num num comes in. <clears throat> the only problem is that the, the analyses that we're going to do are less sort of cut and dry to say it's statistically significant or it's not. We're going to actually build a model. Um, so I'm just going to give you the very basics of this, and we're going to give it through uh, an example called mileage versus speed. And in this case, we want to see if gas mileage for a certain car varies uh, with the speed that you drive it. In other words, if, as you drive faster, does your mileage get better or worse? Are, they two, are the two things related? Now, we probably know the answer to this, but this is just some statistical analysis. So the first thing that we want to do always is to say in the English language, right, we're doing our PGA wheel. I wonder if, I wonder if, and you'll pardon the pun here, if speed drives mileage. Huh. Right? Okay, so let's make a plot of that and see what we can say. Now the key plot here is called a scatter plot. Because both of these two things are <clears throat> numerical, a scatter plot helps us tell. Uh, a scatter plot looks like this, and it can help. It's basically ordered pairs. So here's an example of somebody who drove about 48 miles per hour. Here's an ex uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, here's an example of somebody who drove about 48 miles per hour and got about let's say 27 miles per gallon. Here is somebody who drove about 66 and got about 19 miles per gallon. Okay, and here's somebody who drove 81 and got about 12 miles per gallon. Let's call it 82. Okay, so it's ordered pairs. All right, so in this case, what we're going to do is um, um, we're going to evaluate and we're going to look for trends and outliers. So in this case, it looks like, think about this. If you can draw, if you could lay down your pen and you can imagine drawing a line that fits the data pretty well or some curve, later on we'll draw some curve. But right now, let's keep ourselves to a line that fits the data pretty well. Um, um, that is, um, that's going to be something that we're going to want to go on uh, further with and do some more analysis. Okay, so um, different plot. This is called the scatter plot, and this, ha this one happens to show a strong negative linear trend. There's a couple of other things that we can look at, like here's, for example, a positive trend. This also would be strong linear. Here's something that shows essentially no trend. No, or no relation to each other. We call the shotgun. Where do you draw the line? You could draw a line like that, or like that, or like that, or like that. They're all basically okay. A situation like that is called shotgun, no line. In other words, there's no relationship between the two. 
Okay. Here would be maybe a weaker relationship. Right? So it's the points are kind of spread out, but they are lined up. But they're spread out more than they are in this guy. Okay? So that's basically uh, what we're looking for. Okay, now that we've plotted it, certainly looks like speed might be a driver of gas mileage. Let's back it up with a calculation and let's see how that works. All right. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at to see we're we're going to look at whoops. Let me get that let me get our mileage and gas our gas mileage thing open here. Discharge time from the hospital. Backlog volume. Whew, got a lot of stuff open. Here's our gas mileage. Okay. Mileage and gender. Oh, that's mileage and gender. That's not the one I want. Driver speed. That's not it either. Okay, here we are. I've got mileage versus speed open, and you can see it is a cat cat. I'm sorry, I'm num num. My goodness. So let's go ahead and select two num. Num num. And, you know, sometimes Excel stats doesn't get exactly, um, uh, it doesn't format it exactly that you want to do, so you might have to change. Uh, if you know a little bit of Excel, you can format the axis, like I'm going to, to go ahead and change that. And I'll change it, I don't know, from, say, 40 to 100 instead. And you can see that that's what it did. It made that look a little bit better. Okay, we already did this. Let's go ahead and mosey on over to the core and linear regress. That means that stands for correlation and linear regression. A lot more on this later when we cover this in more detail. Um, but let's take a look at that. So the first thing will be uh, we want to look at the correlation uh, analysis. Okay, and I think. Probably, we'll get into this more often in a later week, but we have an idea of correlation, what that means. As one goes up, the other one also goes up, or as one goes up, the other one also goes down. They're related to each other. We want to see if that correlation coefficient is equal to zero versus it's not equal to zero. So we'll click on this not equal, and in fact, it shows that they're very different. Again, that's a very, very small p-value, extremely small. And you'll find that this is usually true when you have anything that you can draw a line that <laughs> looks like a reasonable line. Okay? Now, the second thing that we're going to look at is we're actually going to, once we're done with that, <clears throat> we're going to find that that's not all that interesting. Where the real meat is, is in the linear regression itself, because then we can use it to make some predictions, which we're going to make pretty soon. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, on this one, we're going to come down and we're going to learn how to read all this stuff. Uh, but right now, um, uh, right now, we're simply going to uh, we're simply going to note that oh, there it is, right there. That this draws a line for us, that pink line right there, and that line is given by um, minus 0.4, roughly 0.4 uh, 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 times the speed plus 0.47. So for every mile an hour that you drive, you lose about 0.4 of a gallon is what that's saying. Okay? So um, and we can, you know, take the, the decimal points out of that one, show fewer decimal points. Okay. Now, if you want to, you can also see some tests. And, and it turns out that statisticians are pretty interested. If you notice I'm going down a little bit further. Um, Statisticians are pretty interested in two tests. One is, is the slope equal to zero versus it not? Not sure why the, the not equals are in there, <clears throat> aren't in there. And that one, as you see, comes out to be very small, basically the same as with the correlation. So that means, yes, the slope should be in, or the, the intercept, uh, uh, the slope should be zero, or the slope should be in there. And the second is, is the, should the constant be in the model? And this also says that that should be in there. 
So that constant of 47 is important to keep in the model, as well as that slope. All right, we'll do more of this later. But another thing that's kind of nice is if you go down lower, uh, you can enter in different values, and Excel stats will help predict them for you. So it'll give you a prediction point. So for example, if you're going to do 60 miles an hour, what gas mileage might you get? Well, it would predict you do 22.7 miles per hour, um, miles per gallon. I mean, let me open this up so you can see that a little bit better. There's the, whoa, there's my speed. Did that too fast. <laughs> there's my speed, 60 miles an hour. It said I get 27 miles per gallon. I don't think I need all those decimal points. There, that's a little better. Okay. And it even gives me a confidence interval on that, which is kind of cool. It says 22.8, but probably somewhere between 18.7 and 27. Now, the only thing that you can say is that when you're making predictions, be a little bit careful. So, for example, I can type in, I can type in 100, even though I don't have data out there. I can type it in, and, many, and, and Excel stats will give me something back. It says if I drive 100 miles an hour, I'm going to get 6 miles per gallon on that 6.4 and I can even drive a thousand if I drove a thousand it says I would get negative 63 the point I wanted to make here is that all of this can be is garbage in garbage out okay if you put in unreasonable numbers into your predictor uh, that is notice we have no data out here to support this so our model is not going to hold water but this is just a dumb stats program. All it knows is, yeah, I can fit a line to this, and you plug in any number you want for the speed, and I'll give you an answer back. Okay? So just sort of like buyer beware, user beware. If you plug in re unreal unreasonable numbers, it might give you an unreasonable number back. So always check to make sure that you're putting something in the range. Notice when I put in 100, it was already out of the range. If I put in 1,000, it would be somewhere way out here. Okay. So it doesn't make sense. Okay, and that's the in very quick introduction to linear regression. Now, again, all of this stuff is uh, is given in the slides, say forty six, um, uh, in slides forty five and forty six. Okay, now I want to make sure that we we both know this that we've only scratched the surface of the regression analysis. We are going to cover back. Uh, we are going to cover this to a much greater extent later in the course, um, where we're going to do uh, residuals analyses and all that. OK, so that's basically it. Uh, there's a couple of examples in the back, some of which we've already gone through, and some we haven't. So uh, these are going to be in your, some of these are going to be in your homework. Uh, some of them are now covered for your homework. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for you. All right, what do we cover? Well, we covered one variable analysis, and we covered two variable analysis, um, and we covered all the how to analyze doing it in Excel stats. Now it's your turn. In your view, what are the key takeaways of this section? What are the key questions that you can answer as a result of this, and how can you support business improvement with this section? Well, this was a long one, gang, and uh, we've come to the end of it. So um, hopefully uh, you found it. Uh, hopefully you found it helpful and uh, we went over a lot of different examples that are in your week 3 binder from slides 16 to 59. Okay, see you later.